morning and welcome to the 2007 Innovation Summit. My name is uh, James Almeida and I am the Associate Dean of the Silverman College of Business. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome all of you to this beautiful campus of ours and especially to a forum that is going to be involved more in terms of promoting the exchange of ideas. We take great pride in the fact that the Silverman College of Business through the Rothman Institute has been involved in promoting entrepreneurship in the state and in the region much before entrepreneurship became a cool topic to talk about. So today, nowadays, you can't really talk go to any place without people talking about innovation and entrepreneurship. So from that standpoint, uh, you know, we have truly been leaders in promoting that particular concept. I don't have to tell this, uh, uh, you know, all of you here that innovation or entrepreneurship is not so much about ideas. Ideas are a dime a dozen. What is of great importance is what do you do with the ideas, whether it is in terms of the, you know, developing the capabilities within your organizations to translate the ideas into actual results, whether it is in terms of developing a culture of innovation or creativity, or whether it is in terms of empowering your colleagues and fellow employees to engage in this process of translating the ideas into actual products, that's the key. And it's a great pleasure uh, that we have today in having some great case examples that can serve as best practices in terms of experiences that our fellow presenters have themselves lived through in their own companies and perhaps we could imitate in our own respective organizations. There is no sense in going about reinventing the wheel every time and sometimes it is, you know, may as well serve to copy from somebody else's experiences. <clears throat> As uh, in terms of the globalization that we confront today, you know, with uh, uh, all the trade, about, all the talk about, uh, you know, the uh, dangers of international trade and so on, uh, one of the clear aspects in that debate is the fact that it is innovation and, for that matter, entrepreneurship that will be the savior as far as making sure that the U.S. continues to have its at least be, if not an economically dominant player, being one of the economic dominant players in the world. Rupert Murdoch once famously said that uh, in this uh, dynamic world that we operate today, it's not the big that is going to be defeating the small, but clearly it is fast that will beat the slow. And whether that fast is within a large corporation or whether it is within a small infant startup, Clearly, those are the key issues that we have to confront in today's world. So without much uh, uh, of an ado, I know you are not here to hear me speak, uh, uh, but uh, again, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you here. Uh, and uh, before we turn it over to our presenters, I'd like to invite uh, James Baroud, who is the director of the Rothman Institute, and who has been a very key uh, uh, player in uh, making sure that the flag of entrepreneurship and innovation is flying strong, if not at least in the state of Jersey, certainly on this particular campus or for the university. So, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Before we get started, I think it's appropriate to ask for a moment of silence uh, in respect to the tragedy in Virginia and the victims of the recent flooding here in the region. As Jim said, innovation has been an integral part, an important part of our entrepreneurship program for close to 20 years, as it's been our mission to foster and support, teach, research, entrepreneurship, and innovation. Now, as Jim said, while innovation is all the rage today, we know it's been around for many, many decades. As Rosa Beth Moss Cantor recently mentioned in an HBR article, innovation becomes a buzzword or gains industry's attention every half dozen years or so. But I think we all agree that innovation is here to stay against rising global competitors that won't stop. 
Of course, because it's a buzzword, we see innovation everywhere. And I just love when I see it in magazines, um, hawking, uh, let's see, uh, jewelry, expensive watches, and um, my favorite, if I can find it, cities. Did everyone know that Madrid is the quote-unquote capital of innovation? <laughs> well, I didn't, but I, I ask someone to come explain why a beautiful model uh, what a beautiful model, which is the focus of this ad, has to do with the innovation characteristics of a city. It's a model staff. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, God. On the other hand, when I read in Inc. magazine that New Jersey is the second most innovative state in the, in the Union, I'm delighted, but also concerned. Because as I know, we sit on that pedestal Many competitors, whether they're other states or other countries, they're gunning for that recognition and with far greater resources. As we all know, New Jersey has some competitive disadvantages, which we won't get into today. So that's why today's program is so important. The more we can educate our business community, it's going to be better for them and for us, for our state and our nation. Before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to thank our staff and faculty at the Institute. I'd like to thank the Silverman College for Business, Jim Almeida, um, and also our sponsors for making this event possible. These sponsors include Novartis, which has been a consistent uh, supporter of our innovation programs here. Plus, we look forward to their CEO, Alex Gorski, coming to speak at our CEO Innovation Lecture sometime next year. One flight up with whom we've been collaborating on the launch of our brainstorming facility, iSpace. Johnson & Johnson, with whom we, we do a lot of things with different parts of the university, but we hope to be collaborating even further with them going forward. InnoCite, Clay Christensen's team, uh, who we will be partnering with uh, on executive programs going forward. I'm pleased that Steve Wonker, the brains behind the team, is here this morning, right over here. He's, uh, he's going to duck his head right now. Um, don't tell Clay that, by the way. Uh, thanks also to Lee Carlson at NJ Biz, to Brian Moran at Moran Media Group, and Elizabeth Christofferson at NJN for all their support. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Tom Reynolds, um, who is a, an innovation leader, an innovation champion at clearly Johnson Johnson, one of the finest, most admired companies in the, uh, on the planet. Uh, his bio is there. Uh, but he can go into that a bit more. He said, don't worry about the bio, he'll touch on that, so I won't, uh, rather than cut into our time. I'd just like to give some parameters for the day. For those of you new to this forum, we ask you to ask questions uh, throughout the presentation as well as at the end. Uh, don't be shy, uh, but keep your questions short uh, and concise. We will not be passing around a mic, the speakers will be uh, rephrasing the questions so that it's picked up by the video. As an incentive, we have bobble openers on the, uh, in the center of your table, so whoever asks the first questions gets the bobble opener. Tom Reynolds. Thank you. Good morning and welcome everyone to what I hope today will be an exciting exchange of information and hopefully we could all learn through your questions and the various other speakers of new ways to look at innovation. But to start off I just wanted to uh, set the stage with a brief uh, background of uh, what I've worked on in the past to set the stage for uh, the journey that I'd like to take you on this morning. Uh, but first, I've worked in uh, several uh, different industries, mostly within Johnson & Johnson. I actually started in the uh, consumer sector, and when there, I had the fortunate opportunity to launch the Reach Toothbrush. So, so uh, most people uh, use or have a Reach Toothbrush at home? Ever seen it? <laughs> now, what a lot of people may not know about the Reach Toothbrush, it was the first toothbrush brought to market that did not have the American Dental Association's backing, was not 
marketed to dentists at all, and recognized that you could actually sell a toothbrush for 100% premium, and that the return on advertising was far greater than the return on price. So think about, think about that. Do you remember the little reach toothbrush uh, guy in the uh, advertising? And it created a whole new industry. That was one of the first ever to, uh, to uh, recognize that. The question I have for you is when you go shopping for a toothbrush and you look at the generic versus the uh, more proprietary brands, most people buy the proprietary brand. Why? Okay, why is that an innovation? Uh, the second thing, uh, after a consumer, I joined actually the medical device sector and I was involved in uh, knee and hip replacements. Quite a change, right? Uh, and I was part of one of the uh, second uh, major developments in knee replacements, which is a porous coated knee. And I don't know if people are familiar with uh, knees, but the important thing is range of motion. But knee replacements failed mostly because they are cemented in, and the cement would actually crack, and the longevity of the knee would be very short. What a porous coated knee did was actually stimulate bone growth into the material and actually cause the knee to last uh, much longer than ever before. And obviously, if the, I won't ask the question if anybody here has a knee replacement, but if you do uh, have a knee replacement, what you'll find is it changes your life, you become more mobile, pain-free, and it lasts much longer. You know, uh, in the, in the uh, 70s, that was actually uh, not the case. Uh, I also had the opportunity to uh, work and be peripherally involved in our uh, stent, which most people are aware of, both the original stent as well as the, uh, the uh, drug-coated stent, which changed the industry. Now in the newspaper, there's a lot of different questions. Is it as good as people originally thought, etc.? But certainly a major innovation, because think about it. Prior to that, you actually had to go in and get a coronary artery bypass. Think about the difference between now a procedure that you could actually go into and uh, be released from the hospital in days, and your recuperation time is, is almost uh, not non-existent relative to, to that particular uh, product. I also left J&J &J for a time, and I worked for Merrill Lynch. And I went at Merrill Lynch. Merrill Lynch was one of the first innovators to actually launch the cash management account. And um, the reason that was so innovative is financial service firms were all 100% transaction based. So if you remember, right, if the market crashed, they'd fire 100,000 people. They'd come back up and recoup, right, with the economic life cycle. And the question was, how could we become a more fee-based firm in order to maintain our revenues throughout the cycle, uh, as well as they had anticipated that the fees were going to dramatically be reduced with the invention of computers and the internet. Each of these are, are what I would consider to be major changes in the industry. The one thing that I think is, is uh, common to these innovations, unfortunately, is many of those companies, uh, it took a long time to come up with the next innovation. So if you look at Merrill Lynch recently, they've reduced staff by thousands. And along the way, they've had numerous innovations. But the talk of my discussion today is going to be, how do you continuously innovate? Is innovate an accident, coming up with that innovation? How do you continually innovate from the big company perspective? Because what we need, right, is we need uh, to keep our sales growing, our net income growing every year off of a higher and higher base in order to ensure the future of, of, the, of the company. The last thought before I take you on, on this journey is when you look at the Fortune 500 companies 20 years ago, have you ever thought of how many of those Fortune 500 are not actually in the Fortune 500 anymore? How many have actually fallen off, off, the, uh, off the earth, in fact? Many have disappeared, many are bankrupt, and many new ones have come into place. When you look at uh, uh, the book In Search of Excellence, I pulled it out uh, this week as I was thinking about this presentation, many of the companies that are listed in In Search of Excellence are no longer considered to be excellent companies. So, so think about that. The reason I title Chasing Innovation is because it's a never-ending chase. How do you get your mind, your body, and soul into innovation such that you could continually innovate in the future? I'm going to take you, and what I'd ask you to do is sit back, 
and think as if you're part of a discussion, and this is a true discussion that uh, I had at the company I'm currently at, where we looked at our pipeline and we said, you know, we're, we're not getting out of our pipeline what we want. We're really not satisfied how we're approaching things. You know, we need to be innovative. We need to get more out of our pipeline and do things differently. And I'm going to take you through that journey, that discussion, and I feel free to ask questions at any time. The first thing that we had to do uh, when we got a very small team together, and this was a team that believed we had to do things substantially differently, was we asked everybody, what, what is innovation? And of course, you know, I, before coming to the meeting, I went on the internet, and what first came up was, of course, a definition from Wikipedia. Isn't it it's quite amazing that you would get to that immediately, a very innovative source. And there's a series of definitions up there. The question I have for you is for your business, for your opportunity, how do you define innovation? What we defined innovation is, is how do we solve our customers' problems in surgery? Now, to give you a little background, I work for Johnson & Johnson Wound Management today, and I'm really going to talk about projects that work uh, to help the surgeon in surgery, and we make products that, in essence, control uh, bleeding, control complications in surgery, and fluid management. So any surgery, and there's 65 million surgeries that we consider to be our target around the world, our question was, how can we bring value products and services to that market, right? A tremendous market. Innovation through the corporate lens. What was our, what was our real motivating factor, and I think a motivating factor for uh, most companies? When you kind of look at your growth, and you look at your kind of conventional growth, you see a growth rate that you feel is unacceptable, and you want to get a significantly ga a greater growth rate. You look at your competition, and you start to get worried that smaller entrepreneurs may out-innovate you, and you need to get a much higher growth rate, what I call the innovation stretch. The problem with this chart, while it is, is truly, I think, the way big corporations think, is the very innovation that you create could put your lower 7% growth rate out of business. So now how do you innovate, achieve 20% when you might be in fact eroding your own business? These were all the thoughts that we were thinking about and how do you kind of recreate yourself, hit that much higher growth rate when you could in fact make your conventional business in danger. The second thing as a team is we all got together and we said, and I'd ask you to ask yourself these questions. Where are we today? First, we have to take a look at, and considering that we're targeting all surgery, right, and any surgeon in the world is our target, how well do we really know our customers? And, uh, you know, what we found out is probably not as well as we actually thought. When we looked at our pipeline, we said, is our pipeline focused on product iterations or new breakthrough products? We found that many were product iterations and really not breakthroughs. Uh, we're primarily a matrix organization, and we said, well, what are the challenges of a matrix organization? How could you make that work? How do your internal processes impact innovation? And the big, big question I asked myself and my initial team is how would you rate yourself as an innovator? How do you even figure that out? And I'll talk to you kind of how we did that and, uh, and, uh, and how we explored that. And we have to be very honest with that question. So the next step of our journey after we kind of did a, a self-assessment, what we said is when you start a journey for innovation, often when you do your self-assessment, what you'll uh, basically think is that, you know, you're a pretty good innovator. Many of the things that you read, you're probably doing already. Uh, but what you really need to do is take a step back and be willing to deprogram yourself. This requires some radical, radical approaches for deprogramming. If you, have you ever sat back for a moment and thought about how you think, right? Have you ever thought when you go to a meeting and somebody says something to you, why in fact might you feel upset, right? Why in fact might you think it's boring or creative? Why, why are you actually thinking that way? How do you forget what you know so that that does not inhibit your thinking? And how do you find out what you do not know? What, uh, what we did is we went out and we actually looked at some, uh, several extreme ways to deprogram ourselves. We went to psychologists, we went to look at uh, all the kind of different uh, deprogramming systems and breakthrough systems, and we sat down and we had a lot of fun with this, and we quickly understood 
how we thought. And the good thing about this was as we went through this journey together, we could actually make fun of ourselves. We actually knew how everybody thought as part of the team uh, and hence went forward. The other thing we did after we did our deprogramming, we said we're going to start from the beginning. We're in school, we're in a new industry, we need to learn a lot about this industry, and we think there's an opportunity to innovate. So let's take a look at that industry, and let's understand, you know, are there winning formulas? What are the best innovators doing? Uh, and how should you actually approach this? So we went back to the beginning as, as a team, and we questioned everything. We did a very, very detailed analysis, and what I'll try to do is kind of walk you through with some examples directly from the industry that we used to kind of do this, this particular analysis. First and foremost, and, and this is what actually, uh, I, a big thing I brought into the equation, and I think I drove the team a little crazy with this, is I said, let's start totally outside the uh, industry. And one of the things I've always done is I've looked at and said, well, you know, how do peak performers perform? Where do you look? There's a lot of clues, there's a lot of easy ways to actually guarantee success, and let's kind of look there. The first is uh, sports performance. As we all know, and I think th this is the key to chasing innovation, the minute you have it right, okay, the minute you sit there and assume you have it right, the entrepreneur behind you will beat you, because you probably have it right by only milliseconds. If we think about the Reach toothbrush, right, and it cleans your teeth better because it has kind of a little different angle, et cetera, as long as we're able to convince you and you're able to visualize it achieves that result, we're going to win. However, the minute a competitor figures out how to make something different that appears to make your teeth a little cleaner, we will lose. And if you go to the grocery store today and you look at the various toothbrushes and you compare it to how they were when we launched the toothbrush, we have 25 competitors. The day we launched it, we had zero. So think about that. That's in a matter of days. When, when you look at training techniques, I'd ask you to look and think about two things. First is, what is your innovation training? Who are your coaches? And how often do you actually engage in training? Every day, are you spending at least an hour training yourself on innovation? And are you training yourself on things that you've never done before? If you look at sports today, and you look at, and, and my uh, wife actually turned this on to me, my wife started yoga about uh, five years ago. And she explained to me the whole concept of getting the mind, body, and soul engaged. Well, what are we reading in the papers today? All the major sports athletes are trying to figure out new ways of focusing, getting your mind, your body, and your soul engaged. How, how do you do that? How many would people would basically say when they come to work every day, they basically have utter passion to solve a problem. That's the test, I think, for innovation. Utter passion to solve a problem. The Olympic athlete has utter passion to win. Are you willing to engage in an Olympic training program? That was a question we had to ask ourselves. Youth. I won't, add, I won't ask people to raise their hand, but how many people would like to have a more youthful appearance with an extended life expectancy. If I told you that I could give you a methodology that guaranteed you could look 10 years younger and you feel both uh, visually and physically, now I'll ask this, well, I wanna ask this question, how many people would be interested and I could start you today and the program's for free? <laughs> okay. Now how many people would think to achieve that goal if it was a little difficult a little difficult, they would be willing to do it. Okay? Now, I'm going to give you the formula. Are you ready? And I'd ask everybody to think about this and go back and test it. The first step to the formula is, and you could go online and research this, mild starvation, okay, eating about one to 200 calories a day less than would be required for your, your weight is the, uh, is the first with mild exercise, preferably a yoga-like exercise to ensure that you're uh, limber, because the main issue relative to uh, aging is actually maintaining your flexibility. And that's why most people, when they get older, actually uh, hurt, lack of flexibility and basic muscle strength. 
And the second thing, which is fairly easy that we could all do, is stay out of the sun. Now think about that. Everybody's willing to pay thousands of dollars to look younger, and there is a proven clinical studies that basically document and tell you that those easy steps right, uh, can actually achieve a much more youthful appearance. And by the way, you could start at any age. So no matter what age you are, if you start the program, you will turn back the clock and slow down the aging cycle. Proven, and yeah, uh, there's a lot of information out there. Investing. <laughs> How many people have pulled an investment book out and would like to be the next Warren Buffett? and would like to dramatically grow their portfolio. Well, you know, when I was in Merrill Lynch, I studied many different investment techniques. And if you go back and you simply uh, follow uh, uh, John Vogel's method of investing, and you looked at uh, indexed investing, and you put your money in the appropriate mix of index funds, and never touched it, and just adjusted it annually, okay, a very simple adjustment, you would outperform 80% of all the money managers and yet how many people do that? Proven formula, it works, and, uh, and uh, many people that do that are, are, are multimillionaires. The other piece which uh, a lot of people don't do is when I was in Merrill Lynch, I, I worked with very several wealthy, um, wealthy clients. And you know when you're driving by that little, little tiny Cape Cod, and uh, you walk in the, uh, in the house and they have a little black and white TV? Most of those people are actually the millionaires. Uh, you know, they've saved their money, they've done this, they've basically invested on a weekly basis, and, uh, and their money just grows. Uh, so not, you know, so investing wisely, proven formula. The next step after we kind of examine those, and our, our conclusion at that point in time was, boy, this could be hard. I got to work out every day, I have to probably go on a diet, I have to find some scientific formulas, and boy, this is going to be hard. The next thing we did is we looked at great innovators and we said, well, what did they do? What was their formula? And here, here's some examples. The, fir the first really are the obvious examples, Ben Franklin, Hen Henry Ford, Thomas uh, Edison, and Steve Jobs. And I want to just drill down a little bit into, and I pulled out medical device examples so you could see how when we were researching innovation, how we tied what uh, medical device innovators did. The first is, is um, Everyone's probably familiar with antiseptic agents. And the problem was when you went to surgery, what was the main problem in the past was, was infection. And Johnson & Johnson was actually formed on really providing sterile right, bandages. Right? So you would think, boy, isn't this like simple today? We would think how simple. When you look at it, you know, Dr. Lister looked at it and noticed there was a problem. People were dying from infection. He took a look at another industry and he saw that there were other products that could be used that were viewed as right infection preventions. And he brought that together and, in essence, dramatically reduced infection rates. And, you know, people at the time kind of thought his innovation was a little crazy and dramatically changed and created a multi-billion dollar industry. When you think about it, the Johnson family today is still benefiting from that industry and many people who implemented those, those particular techniques. Ground changing. So how, how, did he, well, how did he see, we're going to kind of look a little bit more in detail on what, what these people did. The next is uh, anesthesia. Obviously, little surgery occurred. If we look at our old movies, we know what happens without anesthesia. How do you make the uh, connection? Again, passion. This doctor actually experimented on himself in order to find, to find the uh, innovation. The next is the uh, first artificial hip, and, and if you think about this, and, and you, uh, the first artificial hip, 1925, and it was actually first made of uh, glass, uh, and obviously uh, broke, didn't stand up to the tensions. This particular invented, uh, uh, inventor turned to other industries and found uh, stainless steel. So you'll notice each of these inventions correlated actually other technologies and took a passion really to, to move forward and try to figure out how to create that invention. More early ones is the uh, coronary stent, a new multi-billion dollar industry created, and if anybody has had a coronary, uh, knows anybody that had a cabbage procedure versus a stent, you'll, the experience is very different. MRI, which literally changes our ability to uh, diagnose, created a whole new industry, and the uh, pacemaker, which continues to go uh, forward. 
So we analyzed what all these entrepreneurs did, what all these great innovations did. We also kind of went out and met with uh, probably 50 entrepreneurs, small startup companies. We talked to them. We observed them, and we tried to figure out, like, what is it you're doing? We also went and looked for ser you know, uh, serial entrepreneurs, people who uh, innovate time and time again. Just keep in mind, the biggest innovation challenge is you get the one big idea, but the next never occurs. So how do you do this over and over and over again? Is it possible, and is it possible to do within a big corporation, I think is even a bigger question. The first thing we recognized was that these innovators identified the problem and they had a passion for the problem that defied logic. If you uh, talk to Dr. Uh, uh, Palmas and Dr. Uh, on this stent, when he was thinking about the stent, people said it was virtually impossible. And one day going home, he basically uh, stopped off at a radio shack and he brought a series of uh, trinkets. And he went home and he actually uh, started to craft the patent with little springs, et cetera, to demonstrate how that, uh, that opened. Even after he had the patent, to convince people that this would actually work was monumental. To actually have the focus to go through, uh, forward and get that product to market took a tremendous, tremendous passion. The other piece was, was, well, when you're looking at a problem, how do you actually thread and uh, link the problem? Because the, you, you know the problem, so if you look in our case, uh, bleeding is a ma major problem in surgery. Uh, but how do you stop bleeding? How do you actually, you know, many people actually, uh, you know, bleed to death or, or bleeding is a major cause of complications for major surgeries. How do you uh, deal with that? How do you dramatically improve that? And if you do improve that, the outcomes are significantly different. How do you thread those? And I'll talk a little bit about how you could uh, do that and how you get to that. The last is, is success often requires collaboration. How do you collaborate with the right people, the right time, the right degree of expertise? Lesson four is focus, 100% focus, absolute passion. If you don't have passion to create that innovation, and time. It requires more time than you think. So when we learned that is we said, well, where do we start? What are we passionate about? And what we also said was the other thing that we noticed is, right, is that innovations are often timed perfectly. So if you look at uh, Apple, if you look at Apple computer today, you remember about um, five to seven years ago or even ten years ago, the main negative of the Apple computer was it was a closed system. Today, as you read the Wall Street Journal, the main positive of the Apple computer is, is it's a closed system. It could be more functionally friendly and it's not subject to viruses. So it's kind of amazing if you study trends and in innovation, sometimes simply sticking with the same product over time, the environmental conditions will change to your advantage. The issue is, is when you start, you want to pick and you want to have the insight to say, will the environmental conditions help my innovation? The other thing is, is for inspiration as a big company, whether you're, you're, uh, your um, project or your company, when you come to work, do you know why you're there? You're on an innovation team, do you know why you're there? Here's just a couple of examples, but the one that I like the most on this particular piece is Nike. To experience the emotion of competition, winning, and crushing competitors. When I see that, I kind of know why I'm coming to work, so that kind of excited me. Just quickly, we took all that information and said, well, how do we start? Our first step was to create now a full-time team a full-time team that we could train, create these skills, multidisciplinary, 100% focused. So we eliminated the uh, matrix organization. We had to develop various skills. That team developed a very simple four-step process, which I'll walk you through very quickly. So the first question is with regards to customer immersion. How do you gain passion? So picture, I have 65 million target surgeries, right? You go into surgery, everybody bleeds. How do you actually create passion about that? Well, the first thing you do is you go and you work with your customer. I actually spent weeks with our customers. From, and, and, you know, doctors, I don't know if there's any doctors in the room, but many surgeons are magical. I spent a, a two weeks with a doctor. I would meet him at 5 o'clock in the morning, often stay with him till midnight, 
he would get called in a, on an emergency case, and at 5 o'clock in the morning, he looked refreshed. So I couldn't understand how he did it. Understanding every, every issue, every problem that that surgeon has, how is that surgeon actually working? What are the conditions of the patients in a whole new, in a whole new way? As you're doing that, what you'll need is a, cu a couple of different tools. It's very hard work to stay engaged, to actually uh, learn everything that you need, and to cross-reference it. So when we did immersion, we actually did immersion in India, in, uh, in the out, out, you know, outer areas of India, where basically you know, surgery is done in an open room where the window's open, it's not uh, septic conditions, all the way to the most advanced. And, you know, we learned a lot. We learned a lot by looking at that broad range of, of needs. The other piece was how do you capture what you've learned and bring it back to your team? So we developed a series of various uh, tools, and I won't go into them all in uh, detail, but to, to capture very scientifically. So we talked to ethnographers. We talked to psychologists. And we learned how do you capture information such that you could share, share it for years to come. This is extremely difficult. And I think we're still learning how to do that, and, we, uh, uh, and we're looking for different ways as we go forward. Once you understand all those needs, and there's actually thousands of needs, how many people have ever gone into surgery and said they wanted to go or felt great when they came out? So the opportunity for improvement is endless. How do you figure out what to work on and translate those needs into solutions? <clears throat> so what you have to do is come up with a way to pick what you're going to actually innovate on, right, and narrow the field down and prioritize that in some, some fashion. Uh, and you really have to assemble the right brainstorming teams as you're, as you're doing that. Once you've kind of dug down and you've kind of looked at a need in great detail and you've really understand and now picture, you know, when you're looking at, say, brain surgery, there's, there's hundreds of problems relative to managing that particular space. So you have to pick the one or big, uh, two big ones that actually could change the procedure, change the outcome, and you could build on it later. But now when you come to the innovation, what happens is, is I think you often can't get the uh, answer. So we were working on a, a particular project in a, a soft tissue repair. And my, uh, my nephew, and you get ideas from the uh, uh, craziest places, but my nephew it was in the architectural program at Princeton. And my uh, daughter was working uh, in, a, in a particular biology and chemistry class with a science professor. And I happened to be actually talking to them. So my uh, nephew from uh, the architectural uh, major suggested that in order to look at soft tissue repair, I bring in a tent maker. So does everybody think about those huge tents, how they go up, what happens if they tear, what happens if they stretch? So picture we have a tent maker with us talking about soft tissue and prolapse and trying to figure out how to repair that. And we got some significant ideas uh, uh, in that. The other thing I thought was interesting was my uh, daughter's uh, science professor. Actually, I was talking about you know, ideas and how to do this. And he uh, introduced us into some uh, bridge makers. So think about huge metal swaying. You know, how do you deal with that? How do you reinforce that as it breaks? And we actually uh, took those ideas, brought these people together, and got many patents uh, and have many products in development as, as a result of that. Last is, is you now, now you have tons of uh, concepts. How do you go through the sorting of these ideas and ultimately getting them to your concept book and ultimately getting you to the point where you can actually now work on those particular ideas? So the very team that now has done all this work and knows the customer perfectly is now the team that has to implement. The team then goes through, and I won't go through in detail, but, but now it's your rapid prototyping phase. How do you kind of iterate very quickly? <clears throat> How do you keep that team together and continue to build the knowledge necessary to get to the next iteration? In big companies, often our problem is turnover, whereas in entrepreneurs, right, most entrepreneurs work in the same field for 10 to 20 years. How do you achieve that? And lastly, when you look at that, often I think it sounds very simple. However, you know, focus and time is required. More focus and more time. What is your exercise program? Are you willing to get out there and exercise every day with a passion like the Olympic star? New skill development. If I continue to train the same way, 
I can assure you, right, I won't get any better. How do I find and develop these new skills, and how do I do that constantly? Am I committed? My guess is I'm not going to win the Olympics if I work out for six months. I probably have to work out for many, many years. And how do I manage all this? How do I keep it in one spot and build that for the future? Thank you. So, so the question is, is given kind of um, today's cultures, how do you go uh, very far out of the box uh, and take on, uh, on risks? And it, it's, it's a great question because I think when, when we initiated this uh, particular project, you know, that was the first question. You could imagine a fully dedicated team doing probably uh, crazy things. You could imagine us doing yoga together in the room and who knows, singing and doing all sorts of things. And I think what we basically uh, had to do is build the faith initially, and uh, what we needed was about six months to get uh, our feet off the ground, and we had to demonstrate progress. <laughs> and uh, that was the key. I think patience runs out very quickly. So you have to kind of think through how are you going to actually show progress. And in this particular case, what we were able to demonstrate instantly was that we knew our customer and our customer problems better than anyone in the industry and that many people that we actually had on our team that may have had, some have had no medical device experience or clinical, uh, were viewed as surgery experts in under six months. So uh, by following this method. So I think when people saw that, they were like, you know, wow, I want more of that. Uh, so that was, I think, the, the biggest thing is, is uh, and the last thing is, is just the uh, passion. I think that you, know, you need the one or two people that are passionate about it and are willing to fail. Like when we started this, we had no, no idea it would work. And uh, you know, that's, that's the way it goes. You have to kind of take that risk. And I'm still there, so I think that uh, some people kind of believed it worked and we've implemented it, but I think that's the risk on those programs. Okay. Any questions? You commented on threading and linking across industry connections. How does a company, a large company like J&J, do that internally? How do you make sure you're uh, well, you know, the, uh, the question is, is, so how does a company like Johnson & Johnson kind of tie together and share across, across lines and, um, and uh, share in that innovation? I'd say that, you know, Johnson & Johnson, uh, you know, is trying to do that. Probably doesn't, doesn't do it well. I think that how we handle that actually is we um, utilize Johnson & Johnson and all our affiliates in the same way that we utilize external experts. And, and, uh, and I think that uh, that's the way I think you kind of have to look at it. I, uh, the, the best example I could think of is, is if you walk into the center of the Library of Congress, right, you know, um, some people will kind of walk in, and that's kind of J&J, &J, right, our resources. They'll look around, they'll say, this is too big, forget it. Other people will kind of walk in and they'll uh, figure out where's the index, how do I soar through it, and how do I seek out? I think what we're looking for in our people and the skill we're building is, is people that are willing to seek out and find it, and we're also trying to reward others to share. I think we're still at the uh, infancy of that because we were highly decentralized, and now we're kind of making that transition. But we do view that as our single largest opportunity. Uh, innovation that uh, will be coming to market in uh, 2010 out of some of this work is uh, an innovation that uh, if you had a, a gunshot wound, which would actually uh, uh, kill you, uh, is, is a hemostat that you could literally apply, hold for three minutes, and it stops the bleeding and you, and you could move on. It's in clinical trials. It will be actually uh, shown at our upcoming uh, shareholders meeting, and you know, we have to get through the trials. But breakthrough technology, the reason I use that example is we actually shared a lot of knowledge with our pharmaceutical group. They are actually helping with the manufacturing of the product because it's a plasma-derived product and a medical device together. And that collaboration has created tremendous value. But we definitely need to get better at that. Any other questions? 
as innovation teams are always separate, how do you bring that back into the big organization? Well, you know, uh, so the question is, is innovation teams are separate, how do you bring that back in the organization? I think what, what we're trying to do, and it's worked to a certain extent, is at the end of the day, if you take a lot of people out and you expose them to this, to this particular approach and many of the things I, I uh, didn't really kind of get into today, everyone wants to do it. I mean, it's exciting, you're not coming, uh, you know, to your desk every day, you're not worried about right, answering four hours of email and you are singularly focused on, on getting results. So I think the first thing is, is expose and train as many people as you can. And they will actually seek innovative ways. So one example is our supply chain group came to me. Uh, they, we had kind of done a seminar on this. And they came and said, I want to do a customer-focused innovation project. Explain to me how I could do this uh, internally. So they went out, and, you know, we bring cameras, and they went out and filmed people in J&J &J and the customer, and the guy at the purchasing dock, and the result was tremendous. They actually saved millions of dollars off the, the uh, supply chain process in, in doing that. So I think that's the key, giving people the uh, education and, most importantly, the responsibility to be dynamic and, and change. And, and everyone will, will, uh, will rise to the occasion. Any others? Uh, the question is, is what size team and how long did the process actually work? Uh, well, our, actually, we started actually with uh, one team, and that team had uh, six uh, full-time dedicated uh, individuals. And uh, the, the time it took for us to uh, start, uh, learn the uh, opportunity, and, and the cutoff point was, did we actually get the product into R&D? Keep in mind, many of our products take, you know, five years to get to market, so did we make that part of the process? And on average, it takes eight months. So we actually uh, turned about uh, six projects, uh, and, and then we developed uh, multiple teams uh, in order to go forward. And each of the six projects actually resulted in uh, products that are now under development, many in new spaces that we, we never um, were in before. The process seems very entrepreneurial. The question is, now that you've through it, what would you change? What would you do differently? Uh, good question. The question is, the pro uh, process is very entrepreneurial. What would we change and what would we do differently? Well, the, the, the key to the process actually is every time we do it, the next time we actually do it very differently. So one person asked me the question is, well, you know, if you share this with people in detail, are you worried? Can people actually copy you? And, and I could tell you no, because basically what we're doing right now is we're changing that in its entirety. Every time we've done it, we noticed the 400 mistakes we made. So the beauty of, of threading and doing it continually, and, and it's very funny, like kind of the first time we did it, we thought it was atrocious, and then, you know, we kind of had these new products. Then we just sat down and all analyzed it again together. And I have to tell you, you know, what's funny is the team is the worst critics. Uh, the other thing I would change, though, in, in the deprogramming phase, when you come and you do this, remember everybody, the karate kid, wax on, wax off? This is a true wax on, wax off system. You have to do often things that you don't want to do, are counterintuitive, are painful. I mean, you know, I spent two weeks in, in utter pain, and you just kind of sit there and you go, you know, at one point in time, am I really, you know, wasting my time? You know, but, I mean, the knowledge that came out of that was, you know, unbelievable. So the key is, is that we're changing everything every time. Which leads to the next question. What incentive do you give the team to stay together? You mentioned turnover. Well, well, I do have to share with you, uh, one member of the team already left and had that offer, one of the entrepreneurs that he came across. Uh, so the question is, is you know, what incentive do the people have to stay together and, and what do you do? The, the interesting thing was, uh, probably into our second project, uh, you know, leaked out what we were doing. And uh, every major headhunting firm got the team's name. So I got a call one day uh, from a group that said, we would like to hire you and your team intact. Um, so, so, uh, so I had to, uh, and, and uh, later one of our individuals on the team actually left and took off. Uh, it's, it's one of our major challenges. I think, you know, our teams have been disbanded, reformed. I think when you bring on a new team, 
uh, you actually often take a giant step backwards if they're not actually trained you know, in, in the uh, art, and it's much more an art than a science. Uh, and we haven't figured out yet how to combat that. That, I believe, is the single largest reason why uh, big companies ca are having great difficulty becoming serial entrepreneurs. When I think about the REACH toothbrush team and that group and the passion and the focus, right, they all got promoted and they all went off. Okay, they tried to recreate that, but right, that recreation then took years at their next company or, or, or uh, opportunity. So we're actually looking into that. We're trying to figure out how do you embed it in the company. I truly believe if you could embed it in your culture, if you could eliminate 50% you know, of all emails, if you could say an hour of every day is focused on learning and innovation and every day, uh, and really give people that passion and accountability. But you know, we're, we're definitely not there yet. So the question is, Johnson & Johnson works a lot in terms of acquisitions, and, and so what do you do to kind of make sure that that innovation spirit becomes part of the company, lives long, and even how do you kind of look at those uh, innovations? So it's a two-part uh, answer. The first thing is, when you're out there with your customer, when you're out there innovating, you learn of every small innovation going on. So, so for example, uh, and with one gentleman I worked with uh, here in cardiac surgery, we started uh, some cardiac surgery opportunities at J&J. &J. At the end of a year, there was no uh, opportunity, nothing that we didn't understand that was going on in the industry. We captured every idea, met with everybody, uh, and the amount of time and effort and road work and talking to surgeons and being in surgery was astronomical. But that's the first benefit of this approach. You're out there you know everyone, you are known. And you share in a common thing, which is, is you're really not building a business, you're really solving a problem. And the nice thing about healthcare is, who, who, who doesn't want to improve and save lives, right? That's, the, you know, that's very exciting. So that's the uh, uh, issue. I think, again, when you bring, uh, them, uh, bring that technology in, right, and it's now part of the very large corporation, how do you maintain that uh, innovation? And we handle many companies very differently. Uh, you know, in Closures Medical's case, we actually, which is a company that makes uh, internal glues uh, for the body to stop leaking, so to speak, we've actually kept them uh, separate, and we integrate with them when we're talking about solving customer problems, but they're actually not integrated into our processes. So we're looking for new ways to kind of keep that entrepreneurial spirit uh, working and trying to understand how did they operate when we bought them, and has that operation now changed? And has it changed for the better or the worse? So it's, it's a difficult challenge. Okay. Um, uh, one of the recommendations that has been made for uh, you know, trying to get innovation and encouragement of other organization is to restructure the internal processes within the organization to mimic more of the structure that exists outside the organization. So for instance, uh, you know, if you are uh, an entrepreneur who's trying to start up a new company, uh, you literally, you know, what I think you need to focus on the bootstrapping the operations yes. from, from ground up. So, is that something that uh, uh, Dr. Johnson tries to do internally to, you know, so make it uh, not too easy for them to get resources uh, uh, when they are seeking an opportunity or uh, that? So, the question is, is, how do you kind of reproduce the entrepreneurial environment in a big corporation? such as bootstrapping, et cetera. In our case, you know, we were you know, highly bootstrapped. We actually had uh, virtually no money and actually would go into, uh, similar to the Radio Shack story, we would actually create our prototypes ourselves and, and the Radio Shack story. The, the interesting thing, and, this is, and you hit upon the major problem, has anybody ever heard the, about the uh, Dutch effect? Basically, uh, if, if you look at a, countries, right, and you look at uh, especially oil-producing countries, their economies will grow. However, the minute they find oil, and oil generates riches, the rest of the economy shrinks, and you kind of get lazy. So I think the, the problem is, is when you um, have rich parents, 
and you come in and you're not bootstrapped and your lifestyle is very nice, etc. Uh, you know, how do you change the paradigm? Because often bootstrapping actually uh, creates that uh, innovation experience that enables you to do things very differently. I, I think uh, companies more and more are bootstrapping, not on purpose, but because they have to meet uh, double digit net income growth. So the good news is the uh, environment is causing companies to bootstrap more, which I think is actually creating innovation. Shall we? Uh, well, you, um, so the question is, is how much innovation do you acquire versus do you develop uh, internally? I think on a return on investment basis, of course, right, internal development is uh, always the best, right? You get the, usually the greatest return on investment. I think, uh, you know, Johnson & Johnson's, uh, you know, history has been, is, it's been a very large acquirer. And, uh, and, and I think the key is, is uh, spotting acquisitions in the, in the right time. Uh, in the right place. And I think the amount of acquisitions you do really depends on where are you in your cycle. So again, if you're looking out for trends and you're seeing a trend that you're not in and you have the foresight to get in that trend early, acquire huge, large, and quick. Um, and I think that that's the key, is try to figure out what trend are you not in. Uh, the second piece, and, and there I'm talking about kind of companies that are somewhat established, et cetera. One of the things that we do in an outcome of this particular opportunity is you clearly see what all the patents are, you clearly see what all the small innovations are. Take that knowledge and go at risk to purchase those small innovations. So our REACH toothbrush was actually a patent purchased from DuPont for $50,000. The first year of sales of the REACH toothbrush was $180 million. So feel free. Thanks, everybody.